So we want to say Shabbat Shalom to everyone. God bless you. What we will do today, we will first of all, uh, we'll pray together. We will read the Shema. And today in the will of the Lord, we'll, be, we'll continue with the study on the book of Mish, uh, the Mizmo, Mizmo uh, the book of Psalms. And we will continue with Psalm, uh, the sixth Psalm today. I hope you have your Bibles with you. Make sure that your Bibles are always close by because we are going to read from the Word of God all the time as we are here uh, together. So, Abba, our Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that this uh, Shabbat, this uh, uh, morning, we can be occupied with the darling of thy bosom, Mashiach Israel, the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of this world. So bless your word today, bless our time together, pray for uh, the believers that are with us, for Melech Israel, commit them all to your loving care for today and ask that you will help them to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. So we pray in his precious name. Amen. Amen. So let's say uh, um, I'm going to read the Shema Israel, the Shema in Hebrew and then in English. <coughs> Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha, bechol levavcha, ubechol nafshecha, ubechol meodecha. והיו הדברים האלה אשר אנוכי מצווך היום על לבביך ושיננתם לבניך ודיברת בם בשבתך ובביתך ובלכתך בדרך בשוכבך ובקומך וקשרתם לאות על ידיך והיו לתותפות בין עיניך וכתבתם על מזוזות ביתך Again, the Shema in English, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I commend thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And I will stop here with the reading of the Shema. And we want once again to say uh, uh, shalom to everyone. Uh, Please make sure that you are muted uh, all the time. I see that someone on the phone is not muted if it's possible. To keep yourself muted, it will be helpful. Uh, There will not be any disturbance during the meeting. And so again, Shabbat Shalom and welcome everyone to the meeting today. I would like you all please uh, to turn with me to the book of Psalm in Hebrew, Tehillim. And we are uh, are speaking today, this this, uh, presentation, this message today, we are going to deal with the uh, sixth Psalm that is given to us in God's word. And it is very, very important psalm because in this psalm, we see the psalmist of Israel, David. And he is expressing himself in a time of trouble. You and I might be going through some troubles in our lives. Maybe things crept into our lives which are Uh, not honoring to the Lord in in, in our own life, and maybe we fail the Lord, we sin against the Lord, and you can see that David is expressing uh, the the burden that he had in his heart because of the uh, 
a failure, a sin in his life that may, may not have been, un, uh, may haven't been judged in his own life or confessed. And so you notice uh, how he expresses himself when he hasn't dealt with sin in his life and God had to deal with him. And so we read in uh, Psalm 6, to the chief musician on Neginot upon Shminit, a psalm of David. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither hasten or neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me for my bones are vexed. My soul is also so vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul, O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, or in Sheol, who shall give thee thanks? I'm weary with my groaning. All the night I make my bed to swim. Uh, uh, I water my couch with my tears. Mine eyes is consumed because of grief. It waxes all because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. Oh, the Lord, verse 9, the Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and so vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. And I will stop here with the reading of Psalm uh, 6. Beloved brothers and sisters, as the Psalms, as the Tehillim were, re were, were written by David and others in the history of our forefathers, the people of Israel, they were uh, people who were guided by the Spirit of God to write these Psalms, these Psalms, but there were people like you and I who had problems in their lives, who had some failures, some victory in their lives, Obviously, the psalmists of Israel were, were believers. They trusted in the God of Israel, but they did not always live life as they ought to have lived. Even like David. David is a great example. He's a man after God's own heart. He's a man that uh, 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 was chosen by God to be the king of uh, uh, Israel, Melech Yisrael. But at the same time, David had many failures in his life. David was not a perfect man. David, Melech Israel, he had many, many issues in his life, and sometimes God had to correct him. Just like uh, you and I, we are believers in the Lord Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. We belong to him. We are redeemed. We are washed by the blood of the Lamb. But because we are human, we are people, and we are left here, we are challenged day by day, and it's and Shaul Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But sadly, beloved brothers and sisters, many times instead of walking in the power and control of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, we are walking in the flesh. And sin is oftentimes catching up with us, and ultimately God will have to judge. Let me just show you as we are introducing uh, Psalm 6. If you turn back with me to Numbers chapter 32, Numbers chapter 32. In Numbers chapter 32, Moshe said to our forefathers, the people of Israel, in Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23, when Israel have sinned against God and they needed to repent and to be to judge their sins, Mo Moses have said to the people of Israel in verse 23, if ye will not do so, in other words, if you will not turn to the Lord and repent, 
He says, Behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. In other words, <clears throat> Moses is saying to Israel, I'm telling you, rebellion against the Lord and disobedience to the Lord will ultimately find you out because God will have to deal with his people whom the Lord loveth. He chasteneth and he scourges every son whom he received. That's what Shlomo, Solomon said in the book of Proverbs to the people of Israel. That's what the writer to the Hebrews said to the Hebrew believers in Hebrews chapter 12. So in other words, sin, disobedience, and rebellion in the life of God's people will bring upon them the discipline of God, whom the Lord loveth. He chasteneth, just like a father, a Abba. You know, when our children were young, we love them, and we sometimes have to spank them when they disobey, not because we hate them or we want to harm them, but we have to discipline the children, of course, if they grow up and they carry on in their own way, ultimately they will bear themselves the consequences from the Lord directly. But how important it is to bear in mind, Moshe said, be sure your sins have fa will find you out. Let me show you another verse in the Brit HaChadashah. Turn to Galatians now. In Galatians chapter 6, in Galatians chapter 6, the apostle Shaul Paul said to the believers in Galatia, just like Moshe said to the believers in Israel, be sure your sins will find you out. Uh, Shaul Paul said to the Galatian believers, and he said to them in chapter 6 of Galatians, in verse 7, he says, um, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You see, beloved brothers and sisters, it is a principle that is taught in the Word of God that Sin will find us out. In other words, we need to, when we fail, and we do fail. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is an important principle as we are uh, introducing uh, uh, Psalm 6, because in Psalm 6, beloved brothers and sisters, we have David is praying in a time of trouble. He is praying because apparently he did not repent of a certain sin in his life and God visited him. And God have allowed him to be in trouble that brought about David's cry unto the Lord. And so you notice the psalm, of course, is written by David. In the Hebrew, verse 1, it is the introduction in the English scripture but in the hebrew text verse 1 is to the chief musician uh, on neginot upon shminit a psalm of david in hebrew it says la menatzeach bin ginot al hashminit mizmor le david in other words the the chief musician is david is handing handing this psalm to the chief musician this is the one that is uh, the choir director in the among our people of Israel in days of old. And he is given to him and he said to him, really, it is upon Shminit, it's an octave in the music. In other words, you will sing it in that, we can say in that rhythm or that way. And then it is a Psalm of David. So it was sung by Israel in Israel's history when Israel were uh, in the presence of the Lord. And it is a psalm that teaches us the, the need in a time of trouble, how the soul is so troubled, and he or she, whoever is a, a person that is a, a departed from the Lord as a believer, lived a sinful life, unjudged it, did not repent, you will see how the Lord is 
speaking to that person and ultimately that person realizing, like David, like you and I may in our own life, how we ultimately need to turn back to our beloved Messiah, Yeshua, back to our Lord. And so in verses 1 to 7, beloved brothers and sisters, we see David's sad condition. It is a cry of anguish. In Hebrew, we call it Zakat Yesurim. It is a cry in anguish because he was... Uh, uh, he's, he's asking the Lord uh, uh, for a release from the anguish that he is experiencing in his life. In other words, beloved brothers and sisters, because sometimes in the life of God's people, when they carry on <coughs> away from the Lord, <coughs> they, <coughs> they need to release themselves because God has allowed them to experience trouble and so on. And I just recently received a conversation with a certain person that told me, you know, I've departed from the Lord and the Lord and, I, and I've experienced what is it to be away from the Lord. And when I went away from the Lord and didn't stay close to my Messiah, Yeshua, my Savior, my Redeemer, I find out that I've had been so much trouble and, and, and things have crept into my life. I haven't judged this and the Lord have allowed me to experience these things and it, it caused me to, to turn back to the Lord. It's like the, the prodigal son who have turned away from uh, his father's house and have gone astray and end up to be in a pig pen eating pig's food until he realized that he made a mistake and he had to repent of his sin and to turn back to God. It's like you and I, beloved brothers and sisters, we are no different than anybody else. Sin is easily beset us. And we need the mercy of the Lord to help us to turn back to Him. And when we turn back to Him, He blesses us. He gives us joy. He is encouraging our hearts and He ultimately restores His own people. So in the first seven verses, we see David sad condition, crying for anguish, for, uh, uh, for release from this pressure that he had. And of course, in verses 8, 9, and 10, we have David's ultimate, uh, 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 he's expressing confidence in God because ultimately he knew that God has restored him and he heard his cry. So listen to these verses. First of all, in verses 1, 2, and 3, David is telling God his plight. He's giving God, uh, he's uh, giving God after God visited him, he's sharing with God the trouble that he has. It's really, he's telling God, God, here's my problem. You visited me because of my disobedience, my sin. And so notice what he says in verse 1. He is, first of all, he is praying and he says to God, he says to the Lord, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. In other words, David in verse 1 is asking God not to rebuke him in his anger. You know, when God rebuke in his anger, God is righteous. He is Anger is righteous. He has a righteous indignation. And he will judge not only the outside world, but judgment must begin at the house of God. 1 Peter 4 and verse 17. In other words, God disciplined his own people. He disciplined Israel, our people in history. He is disciplining the believers in the present day church age, assembly age as well. God is going to discipline his people. He will ultimately discipline the world. Yes, the world like he disciplined the world in the flood. In the days of Noah, when men continue on in their own way and God judged the world at that time with the flood. Like he judged the city of Sodom. The Amora, Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Lot. When ultimately fire came from God and judged the world. Why does God judge the world? Not because God hates the world. God loves the world. But when we, men, continue in his own way, 
God has to judge because God is holy. Sin must be judged by a holy God. If God does not judge sin, then he's not holy. In fact, beloved brothers and sisters, when Yeshua HaMashiach died on a shameful Roman cross, he was judged. The just one for you and I, the unjust, in order to bring us to God. So judgment will come one way or another. Of course, the Messiah died. Sin had been paid for us. And you and I can trust in him and accept him and, and follow after him. And our sins are forgiven. But if we continue on as believers without to judge our sins to repent when we fail and we do fail, sin is very easily beset us. We need to repent. But apparently, David somehow did not repent. We find in Psalm 51 that he ultimately repent of the sin against Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. But here we find out that David is crying to the Lord and he's telling God not to rebuke him in his anger. Oh Lord, he says, rebuke me not in thine anger. In Hebrew, Be'apcha. Neither chasten me in thine hot displeasure. In Hebrew, the word is chamatcha. When you cham, when you're hot, and you are ready to uh, 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 unleash your anger upon someone. But in God's case, it is righteously, righteous indignation. When God is angry, he is righteously anger, angry with humanity. And he's just. He is just in being angry with mankind because of sin. So David apparently felt the visit of God upon his life. Maybe the Lord have allowed him to experience some problems in his life. You know, the Lord sometimes send us some problems. Be sure your sins will find you out. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap in our own life. It is a practical thing that happened in the life of God's people. Number 32, God's people, the Jewish people, the people of Israel. Galatians 6, God's people of the assembly in Galatia. He's not speaking about unbelievers. He's speaking about the people of God that he's dealing with. David was a child of God. And so notice that, beloved brothers and sisters, in verse 2, as David telling God his problem, in verse 2 you see David's physical sickness that came as a result of something that happened in his life, of sin and disobedience in his life. You notice we read, Have mercy upon me, verse 2. O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. You see, God must have allowed David to experience the consequence of his unjudged sin, even in some ex uh, experiences in his own uh, in his own body, it's not only that he he spiritually could not enjoy the Lord, but even he had bodily issues that rose up out of his unjudged sin. Now, I want to mention, beloved brothers and sisters, that it is this is nothing knew. Sometimes God allow his own people to experience a judgment that fell upon them. Physical experience, a physical judgment, not only spiritual, but physical. If you don't mind, just turn with me for a moment to um, uh, the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5. You remember what happened in Acts chapter 5? to an unjudged sin by Hananiah and Shafira, Ananias and Sapphira. You remember in the early days of the church of the assembly, we read in Acts chapter 5 that but certain men named Ananias with Shafira or Sapphira, his wife, they sold the possession, they kept back part of the prize, and uh, his wife also being privately to it, and they brought a certain part, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter and uh, said, Hananiah, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? 
He says, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived in thine heart? This is in thine heart. Thou hast not lied unto men, but have lied unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, he fell down and he gave up the spirit. Now imagine, imagine if, if every lie that we do, we lie in our life and unjudge it, if God would judge it the minute he judged Ananias and Sapphira, she both and him, both of them died. Physically, they died. God removed them. They were believers. They belonged to the assembly, to the Lord. They were saved. They were redeemed. But God removed them. Now, they did not have to give all what they have sold their property for, but they were in pride, saying, oh, here we give everything to the Lord. And in reality, they did not. They don't need to lie. They don't have to give 1% if they don't want. It's theirs. They don't have to. Out of the abundance of the heart, whatever they give to the Lord, it's a privilege. But don't say something that you didn't do. And then it ultimately you will be disciplined by the Lord. Let me show you another verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice that is another verse that is very interesting because it helps us to see how important for all of us, and we all fail in this, beloved brothers and sisters, how important for us to confess our sins before the Lord and to judge it and to tell him we fail again and we fail again and we sinned again. We repent. We don't have to live like this, but help us, Lord, to turn away from this evil way. Notice what it's in the Corinthian, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read of the condition of the Corinthians believers who are called in chapter 1 saints, but in chapter 11 and all throughout the book of Corinthians, Paul had to admonish them because of their violation of the word of God in so many ways. They were divided. There was sexual immorality. They were taking each other to court. There were divorces. They were on and on and on. There was abuse of the gift. There were, uh, uh, there were all kind of issues. There were idolatry there. They were, they were including in the Lord's table how they abused the Lord's table. And in chapter 11, we read, notice what we read in verse, uh, I'll just read uh, uh, verse 30, just one verse. Because for this cause, because of your condition, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep, meaning many died. The word for sleep here in in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for the believer, when a believer dies, he or she are really sleeping through Yeshua, through Jesus, and they are going to be absent from the body and presence with the Lord. But so God is disciplining his own people, and David, beloved brothers and sisters, in Psalm 6 says in verse 2, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. Oh Lord, heal me. Why? Because my bones are vexed. My bones are vexed. In other words, God had to discipline uh, uh, David because of he did not judge his rebellion and disobedience in his life. And that is so real because David is expressing, and by the way, David is also a picture of the Messiah, Yeshua. David sinned. Yeshua didn't sin. David suffered because of his own sin, like you and I suffered because we sin ourselves. But Yeshua suffered not for his own sins, but for your sins and mine. And you notice what Yeshua is saying. If you turn back to, turn forward to Psalm 22, go to Psalm 22. And in Psalm 22, we read, notice it's very interesting because in Psalm 22, we see David, who wrote also Psalm 22, but it is a, by, in a prophetically, in a type, in a picture, it's speaking about the Messiah suffering. And David suffered because of his own sin. Yeshua suffered because of yours and my sins and David's sins and all the world's sin. We see what we read here in Psalm 
22 in verse 14 and 15. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Psalm 22 is a psalm that David speaks about himself. And God disciplined David, but in a picture, it's speaking about our Mashiach, Yeshua, who had to suffer not for his own sins, but for your sins and mine. Yeshua suffered by the hand of men who beat him, who plucked the hair from his head, from his beard, who placed upon him a crown of thorns, who stripped him and hit him with a, all sort of uh, physically uh, men uh, uh, despised him and spit upon him, but he didn't, he didn't suffer because of his own sin. He suffered because of the sin of this world, your sins, my sins. David suffered because of his own sin. You and I sometimes experience trials because of our own sins in our life. And you know, God knows that. And God is forgave our sins, all of them, past, present, future. But on the basis of Yeshua's death and resurrection, we are forgiven. But God does discipline his own people. David was a saved man, but he needed a, a God had to discipline him. And so David says in verse 2, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are weak. It's affected his body when he have turned away from the Lord and didn't repent. And so in verse 3, as David is now telling God his plight, his problem, in verse 3, David's soul is now, is really a greatly troubled. And you notice what he says in verse 3, he says, my soul, notice that, my soul also uh, is also so wax, but thou, O Lord, and then notice, he says, how long? And he stopped here. It's like there is a pause in this verse 3. But thou alone, how long? How long? How long? In other words, David is saying, Ad matai, how long will you continue to allow me to experience these ex experiences in my life? Spiritually, I'm separated from you. Bodily, I'm in pain. And even morally, I'm. I, how long will it continue on to be like this, O oh Lord? And so what we really learn, beloved brothers and sisters, in the first three verses, that David came to a point that God brought him into a point to turn to God and express his feeling before the Lord. And this is so, so important in the life of every believer in Yeshua the Messiah. We, when we turn away from the Lord and live a life away from Him, Paul said in Galatians, in uh, Romans 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, because God is gracious to us, should we just carry on, continue further and further and further and further away from the Lord? Of course not. Paul says, how shall we do so? Don't you know that when you have accepted the Messiah, you have been baptized or put into the body of Messiah. You have been, the Spirit of God took control of you and you become a child of God. You are a new creation. Them that are in Mashiach Yeshua, in Christ Jesus, are new creation. And therefore, we are different. We have a new nature, new life. We belong to the Lord. We are saints, positionally set apart for God. And we are called to have a walk with the Lord. And when we fail, and we do, I'm mentioning this again and again, because sin is easily beset us. It's always good to turn to the Lord, not to stay away from Him. Turn to Him and say, Lord, I messed up. I fail you. And the Lord is always ready to embrace us. That's so precious because the grace of God 
upon the basis of what Yeshua did for, our, for us, we are accepted in the Beloved. And so now notice, as part of verses 1 to 7, David is sad condition, he is a crying, he is in anguish, he is seeking release. And so in the first three verses, David telling God his problem, but now in verse 4 and 5, David is pleading for God's mercy. He told God that spiritually he was not right. He told God that bodily he was in pain. He told God that morally he is, he is, uh, is not right. Now he is pleading with God for God's mercy. And so, notice that. They're so very precious. It's touching the heart when we think about it. In verse, in verse 4 and 5, first of all, in verse 4, David is asking God to return. He's asking God to deliver his soul. And he says, using the word, return, O Lord. Notice that in Hebrew it says, Shuva Adonai. Shuva Adonai. You know, notice that when the, ser when the servant of the Lord have to ask the Lord to return, it is because the Lord could not bless him any longer when he or she are in a away from the Lord. When this expression is found three times in the Hebrew Tanakh, Shuva Adonai, Shuva Yehovah, three times it is found in the Hebrew scriptures, and the thought is that, God, I want you to turn back to me. I've messed up. I've sinned. I'm, David is pleading for God to return to him. And so he says, verse 4, Return, O Lord, deliver my soul, or save me for my mercy's sake. You see, you know, when we say the benediction, we say, Yivarchecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panav elecha ve'ichunecha. Yisa Adonai panav elecha ve'yasem lecha shalom. In other words, we want the face of the Lord to shine upon the, the servants of the Lord. Yevarchecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panav elecha. May the Lord shine His face. May His face shine upon you. But the face of the Lord was not shining upon David because he was at this time in a wrong spiritual condition, unjudged sin. And so that's why he says, Shuva Adonai, Shuva Adonai, return, <clears throat> notice in verse 4, return, O Lord, deliver my soul, or save me for thy mercy's sake. You see, God, I want you to be back in my life. Return, O Lord, you know it is mentioned <clears throat> a few times. Actually, <clears throat> it is mentioned in Numbers 10 and verse 36. Moshe said to the Lord in Numbers 10, Shuv Adonai El Ohalecha. In other words, return to your tent, to your place, to the place where you are belonging. In other words, when God was leading our people of Israel in days of old in the wilderness, the ark was taken out and God was leading Israel. The cloud was there re representing the presence of God. But when God stopped, the ark had to return into the tabernacle. And Moshe was saying, Shuva Adonai, El, 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 el Mishkenotecha. It is in Numbers chapter 10 and verse 36. In Psalm 90, if you just turn back to, uh, forward to Psalm 90, and you notice what it says there in verse 13. Psalm 90 and verse 13, we read, uh, Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servant. And the servant here is Israel. In other words, Lord, you turn away from Israel because of Israel disobedient. Lord, you turn away from David when I was in a, in a state of disobedience. Please return. I'm repenting. I realize you have dealt with me. You have disciplined me. But now return into my life and lead me. Now, of course, we know that the Lord, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, never leave us nor forsake us. But the approval, 
upon his servants cannot be when his servants, when his people live in unjudged sin. He cannot bless us. See, we as believers today in the present day age of the assembly, the kehilah, the, the church age, the spirit of God is indwelling every believer and he will never leave us. But we can grieve the spirit. We can quench the spirit when we don't obey the Lord and live in sin. And that's why he cannot bless us. Beloved brothers and sisters, sometimes we feel it in our very own life. We see it. We experience this in our own life. God cannot bless his people when his people do not live in the light of their calling. He can't bless us. He can't put his stamp of approval. There's a cloud in the fellowship. We cannot have fellowship with the Lord when sin comes. You know, John said it this way. Let me read to you in first. John chapter 1, John said it to the early believers. I want you to notice that. 1 John chapter 1, and I'm reading just the first few verses. John said like this, If we say that we have fellowship with him, this is verse 6, 1 John 1, 6, And walk in darkness we lie, and do not the truth. And then verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the principle that we learn from both the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures in the history of Israel, as well in the present day from the Brit HaChadashah and the New Covenant in the, in the days in which you and I live in today. And so now notice then, <clears throat> back to our chapter, and by the way, where it says in verse 4, Psalm 6, verse 4, it says, Shuva Adonai, return, O Lord, three times in the scripture, uh, Numbers 10, 36, Psalm 90, verse 13, and here Psalm 6 and verse 4, Shuva Adonai, there is one time it's mentioned in uh, in Hosea 14 and verse 1, in relationship to Israel, where God said to Israel, Shuva Israel, Israel return. Israel, you disobey the Lord, you return to the Lord. And we also in our present day are called to return to the Lord and to follow after him. And so in verse 5 now, Psalm 6, in verse 5, and then uh, David says, for, for in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? In other words, David is saying in verse 5, he says concerning the giving of thanks, he says, if you will discipline me and ultimately remove me to Sheol, that word Sheol here is found in verse 5, is a word for the grave in the Hebrew the word Sheol oftentimes is applied to the grave, but you know, the word Sheol is much more than just a physical grave. The word Sheol is the equivalent of the Greek Hades. And Sheol in Hebrew, Hades in Greek, applies to the departed, the place of the departed spirits. Hades is a place where there was more than one compartment where the one side, you might say, are the unbelievers there, are in Hades. Then on the other side, in another compartment, in the place of the departed souls and spirits where the believers were. If you remember in Luke 16, when the rich man died and Eliezer died, Eliezer went to Abraham's bosom and the rich man went to Hades, to the, deep, to the place where the departed, unregenerated souls are. There he said, Father Abraham, send Eliezer that he will dip the tip of his finger and I will be, uh, I'm tormented here. Abraham in his bosom, in the, the, the place of the departed souls and spirits of the believers, Abraham and Eliezer were in a good place. The rich man who did not believe in God was tormented. 
So Sheol in Hebrew applies to the place of the departed spirits. Now, of course, the believers today are no longer in Sheol, in the place of the departed spirits, because the Lord Jesus took them, Yeshua took them to glory. They are absent. Every believer today is absent from the body and not going to Sheol, but going to be present with the Lord. But the unbelievers are there. And in David's days, before the Mashiach Yeshua came, before the Messiah died, there was still that place of the departed spirits of both. On one side, separate from one another, the unregenerated. On the other side, the believers, the, the saved. And the, there was, uh, in other words, David is saying, if, you, if I'll die, in other words, uh, and if I, he says in verse 5, death, in death there is no remembrance of thee, and in the grave... Uh, who shall uh, give thee thanks? In other words, what David could see with the limited understanding that he had. You and I have so much more understanding today because we have the complete canon of Scripture. David say, in other words, if I'll die with all the pain and the punishment, who is going to praise you, God? In other words, David wanted to give thanks and praise to God, and God have allowed him now to experience trials, difficulties, tribulation in his life that caused David to repent and turn to God, even though the particular sin is not mentioned. But the consequences of his evil doing, his sins, are clearly seen here. And so David is saying in verses uh, 4 and 5, He's pleading for mercy from the Lord. Shuva Adonai, return, O Lord, return to me. Come back. I'm ready now to live for you. And so now in verses 6 and 7, beloved brothers and sisters, now David is expressing his, uh, his uh, exercise, his sufferings to God. And notice, and I'm reading these two verses, very interesting. In verses 6 and 7, I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. See, David was was crying and he was wetting his bed with tears. In Hebrew, dma'ot. Dma'ot. You see, that affected him. His rebellion against the Lord, whatever sin this one may have been, it affected him. He couldn't sleep at night. He's weeping. He's wetting up his couch and his bed from, from tears. Weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping the whole night. Knowing that he deserved what he received. He's crying. He's weeping. And he's wetting his bed, his couch with tears. This is amazing. Because that's what happened to us, isn't it? When God disciplines us because of sin in our life that is unjudged and unconfessed. Be sure your sins will find you out. Whatsoever man soweth, so shall he reap. Then we weep. And all of us know it from experience. And we wet our bed from the tears that we weep. But thank God, beloved brothers and sisters, God is so merciful and so gracious. He wants us to experience our wrongdoing. So we will appreciate what he has done for us in providing for us the Savior, the Redeemer, the Mashiach, who himself also wept, but he did not weep for his sins. He wept for you and for me. He wept at Lazarus, at Eliezer's grave. The shortest verse in the Bible, Yeshua Bacha, Yeshua wept, Jesus wept, is found in John 11. The shortest verse in the whole word of God. Two, two words. Vayivke Yeshua, or Yeshua Bacha. Jesus wept. He wept throughout his experience here in this world with all the suffering that he have experienced here in this world. Beloved uh, brothers and sisters, we do read about the tears that he shed himself as we do read them in Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 6 and 7. It does say, uh, he says also in another place, thou art the priest, uh, 
forever after the order of Malkitzedes, who in the days of his flesh, we are speaking about the Lord Jesus, the Lord Yeshua, in the day of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. In other words, God ministered to Yeshua the Messiah, but Yeshua's tears was not because of his own sins. It was because of our sins that he had to suffer, first of all, in his life by the hand of man, but ultimately sin was not paid in his life. Sin was paid when God judged him on the cross for the sins of this world. This is fascinating to understand it. And so, beloved brothers and sisters, now in verse 7 of Psalm 6, we read, Mine eyes is consumed because of grief. It works all because of all mine enemies. Apparently, God sent enemies against David to allow him to experience his disobedience against the Lord. So, beloved brothers and sisters, Psalm 6, verses 1 to 7, David, sad condition, a cry of anguish for release from the discipline of God that fell upon him. But now, the last part of this psalm, Psalm 6, verses 8, 9, and 10, David, after he released himself before the Lord, and after, as we have just read, he told God his problem, he pleaded with God for mercy, and he expressed his suffering before God, he turned to God, and now in verses 8, 9, and 10, David now has confidence that God has heard him, and that God will respond to his repentance. And so we do read in verse 8, 9, and 10, listen, and as we conclude here, in verse 8, David is uh, sure that God have heard his call, his cry to him. So we read in verse 8, he says, Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. Notice how it is interesting. The voice of my weeping. Weeping is just, it's almost like a no voice. But his weeping, his expression, his confession, his repentance, his realization that he went away from the Lord was heard by the Lord. And David was confident in this. David was sure that God had heard his cry. And you notice he says to all the workers of iniquities, depart from me. In other words, don't, I don't want you to, to, to come and I don't want to be with you or be like you or live like that. Depart from me, he says to this work, all ye workers of, of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. Apparently, the Lord have allowed David to experience this sad, sad uh, uh, situation in his life when he turned away from the Lord. In verse 9, David is now not only that he's sure that God heard his cry, but David is sure that God received his cry, his confession, his prayer. And so in verse 9, the Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. He will receive my prayer. That's what David had this assurance, beloved brothers and sisters, that the Lord had received his prayer. That is so important to understand as David is praying. Now I want you to read with me. Uh, this verse, very interesting verse in Psalm 65 and verse uh, 2. O thou that heareth prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. God hears prayers, but he is responding to the prayers of a sincere confession of those who turn to him. If one is unsaved and unbeliever in God, he or she must confess that they are sinners. And if, if they will confess and repent of their sins, God will save them, deliver them, and bring them into his own flock to be part of the chosen people, the, 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 the people of God. But if believers have gone astray, like you and I at times, 
when we repent, God hears our prayer. We confess, God hears it, and He forgave us, and He restores us to a fellowship with Him. And so at the end of the psalm, Psalm 6, verse 10, David is stating a fact that God's enemies will ultimately be judged. And they will stop to continue in their own way. They can continue for a while, but there's a day coming when they will ultimately be judged. And so we read, let, let all mine enemies be ashamed. And, and so vax, let them return and be ashamed. And notice the word suddenly. There is a day coming, beloved brothers and sisters, that God will judge this world in righteousness. All his enemies will be judged ultimately. And so just to conclude, I'm going to read 1 Peter one more time. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. There we read, listen to that. For the time is come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? All God's enemies will ultimately be ashamed and suddenly God will ultimately judge. Just read Revelation 19 from verse 11 to chapter 20. In verse 4, and you will see the, the final judgment that will come upon all that re rebelled against God, all who did not accept God's forgiveness, God's anointed one, the Mashiach of Israel and the Savior of this world. His name is Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. Well, God bless you. May God bless his word and encourage our hearts. And as we just about to say Shalom, we pray that the Lord will encourage our hearts and cause us to continue to follow after Him. Amen. God bless you.